assets put together for their purposes in many kinds of ways. It's something that they didn't really imagine. In the, in the initial days, they put together the investments and deposits of wealthy people and used that for investment. But the kind of creation of mass banking created a situation where they actually have control of, the, of lots of small deposits and are then able to make decisions about where to invest in a particular city or a particular region, what kinds of things to invest in, and all of that with money that is our money. Not just our small deposits, but the pension funds that have been collected for us in various ways that they've actually taken what is very small amounts of money on the individual level, but when you put together and pool that of, of that. And so that's one of the moments where the world of ordinary revolving debt that we all live in and that larger world of how the capitalist system keeps credit going to capitalists and, and getting paid intersect is at that moment. Um, Alexander Hamilton wrote that uh, a uh, revolving debt would be a blessing to this country. And I just want to make sure that your argument is against uh, the management of debt itself and not against debt per se. Well, I think all of us, you know, are speaking about debt and credit and mechanisms of debt and credit specifically within the capitalist mode of production. So we're talking mostly about money and finance. But there's also a way of thinking about it, you know, debt is something very basic to the way that we imagine our relationship to one another, the way that we imagine our relationship to the world. And so, you know, it's not inherently a sort of negative construct or concept to work with. And I think in this moment in particular, there really is a struggle, you know, to try and articulate a different vision of, of how we might think about you know, owing something to one another, owing something to the environment, etc. I don't know if that directly answers your question, but... I got a question you might be able to answer is, uh, wasn't there a debt jubilee when the United States formed with a majority of the company, uh, countries that it had had money loaned to it besides like the Danish and the French? Like, the money that uh, the English were owed and things like that. There was a there was a debt jubilee, a debt jubilee with that, or uh, I don't know. It's a historical question, but it it might be worth it might be worth asking with all the sort of talk about the necessity of debt from Alexander Hamilton. Well, it wouldn't surprise me that it's not uncommon for newly independent countries to declare the debts that before the moment of independence null and void. I don't, I'm not enough of a historian of colonial America to know whether exactly how that took place uh, when the United States began. But, but that really is a whole other kind of question. One of the interesting things about debt is to begin to separate out different elements of it. The issue of a national debt and how, how nations are in debt either to other nations, that becomes one of the major ways in which the control of the politics of not of nations that are indebted to uh, to the large banks in the north will become uh, structured. Or those other ones. I must say, this is one thing to say something about the project that we were doing, which was also, I think, as Drew put out, trying to imagine a different kind of way of research and a different kind of way of presentation than kind of. Uh, a single figure and there were I think uh, probably eight or nine of us who were working on the debt project only three of us could come here tonight but people were working on the issues around ecological debt and thinking of what it means to think about a debt to the environment about the debts the, in a sense of a kind of moral debts that there are a way one of the intriguing things about this society is to take that larger issue of what we owe to one another how our debts the kind of moral debts between people are then always imagined through a kind of financial nexus, through a cash nexus. And it's very hard to take apart 
the kind of larger discussion of debt and what people owe to each other in a society and how that would be imagined and then the very strict kind of sense of a financial debt with a particular interest rate and things like that and uh, I know we can't do all of that here but much of the last and some of the other work is available up on the on the internet we if anyone is interested we'll, we'll get that put up on the uh, the site of, of some of those other ways to understand and think about that as Uh, to return to the question of uh, moral responsibility or the myth of moral responsibility, um, I, I'd like to just sort of uh, uh, cite the example of uh, where the big banks uh, are, are uh, coming up with mechanisms to confuse the kinds of debt that we are encumbered by because, of course, the moral responsibility idea tends to focus on sort of spending beyond your means or uh, uh, using credit to buy luxury goods, that kind of thing. But um, you'll know that Bank of America and other banks issue these checks uh, in the mail to you. Uh, and uh, the idea is that you can simply sign them, uh, address them uh, perhaps to uh, what, uh, your electrical company or uh, maybe to pay your uh, rent. And therefore, uh, while the it, it's, it's the same credit account, the actual debt uh, is incurred on the necessities of life. Um, so I, it's just uh, one of those points that, you know, the, the credit card tends to be associated with purchases at, you know, at, at fine stores and that kind of thing. Uh, but this idea of the check um, really kind of blurs the line between uh, those things necessary for uh, basic reproduction uh, and, uh, and what we would call luxury goods. So I, I, that's just an example, and uh, you can do with it what you will. It does, you know, it is intriguing to me. It's another place where, uh, think of how much ink has been uh, spilt over the issue of whether or not it's moral for people to walk away from their houses if they're underwater. And whereas the banks would have no problem walking away from an investment where they felt like they weren't getting the proper return or whatever. And that, well, that line, partly the, the confusion of the credit system and the financial system and ordinary living in debt means that there's this constant back and forth that, well, they don't actually have to live up to moral standards on the other hand, but on our side of this, we this is entirely a moral issue and that we should never think of this as if we were kind of rational economic actors, which I think would be a strange way to do it. I think then we really do, if we think more about the revolving credit, I must say, for me, the accounts of in some ways the historical examples are good because they take you out of things that are just seen naturally. And to think the degree to which 150 years ago women would go to pawnbrokers every single week and basically when the to to get money and then when they had some they would buy back and then just constantly rotate the same piece of clothing the same pocket watch maybe there was a week when they didn't have to maybe there were weeks when they had to even find something else and that this was just a regular part of how to smooth out a week between pay packets is really i think a more of a way to understand what actual credit cards are for most people who have credit cards uh, rather than the idea of a particular splurge or something like that uh, and that sort of that continuous did you oh, I just... I've done a few bankruptcies for people who were very low income and uh, I, that was when I first witnessed what, what goes on, which is that the credit cards have very low limits, like like two thousand dollars. The the low income person who's using it, they, probably because they were they were unemployed for a while or they're making an adequate income, they run it up to the limit, and then they're just paying interest. I mean, when people talk about indulgence, people in the past weren't paying six hundred dollars interest. The interest didn't used to be a household expense for your daily for your daily life purchases, and now most people are paying interest on top of all their other expenses. Brief history of usury. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, and most people's. I mean, you, you'll certainly find things that maybe 
you could make a, a slightly different choice, but the majority of the things that people go into large debt for are either sort of the continuous interest rates on, on basic accumulations where they just have no, because of the way of their life, they, they raise, as you mentioned, they raise their credit card to the max, or the, the number of things, the largest expenditures are college education, which is several hundred thousand dollars, a car or a home. And these are the basic necessities for participation in, in daily life. And these are things that are always, that we're continuously induced to, to buy, that we're always told are the responsible choices to be making. So to be told that we're irresponsible because we're in debt, because we've been bought the, bought into the things that we've been t induced to buy to become responsibility is a, a bind, uh, is a little, you know, double bind. Double, double bind. Just quickly, the, the level of interest rates that people are dealing with today, I mean, is really unique in the history of human civilization. It's really only in the past several decades that these usury laws have been eliminated um, so you know it's certainly something to to resist yeah I have a question it's okay <laughs> this one won't be a softball though I promise uh, how do you feel like uh, the form of wage labor and the way that it affects the commodity nature of money, or excuse me, the fetish, the fetishized no, uh, nature of money itself is bound up to the way that people live in terms of making, uh, going to a job, getting paid to wa uh, being paid a wage. And I'm thinking about this in the context of like, say, feudalism or slavery, right? I mean, slavery, you could consider uh, wage slavery, you know, where you've just privatized taking care of your slaves a little bit better. Uh, maybe that's a kind of a coarse way of putting it, uh, but it does certainly have a certain charm. But how do you feel that uh, the commodity nature of money itself is bound up to wage labor? I think that the thing that was so paradoxical about a free labor society, give it that name, was that in other forms, it was pretty clear that this was an unequal exchange. In slavery, the slaves were pretty clear about what their situation was. Even in, the, in various forms of serfdom, where someone had to work so many days a year on the Lord's Manor or whatever, or where you had to work for the government for some number of years. And so the remarkable thing, and it, is both, it was both in many ways free and emancipating, because it was always Marx's argument and, the, and I think the argument of the social movements that compared to earlier forms of oppression, there were many emancipations that came with the free markets and free labor. But the thing that was so remarkable was that free labor disguised the forms of exploitation that were still there. And that the wage, it looked like you were being paid just for what you'd agreed to pay for. You know, I agreed to work for $11 an hour. Okay, I got my $11 an hour. And in some ways, that's what the debt thing is as well. And it does seem to me that the power of the kind of analysis of the fetishism is not finally, because we can't really change the society by just thinking about it differently. But if we don't break our own thinking with the illusions and force ourselves to imagine imagine some other way of seeing it, it becomes hard to organize and try to challenge that society. And that's where I do think that we've probably got a better sense, indeed, of the fetishism of commodities, which is to say the simple notion that these commodities are things that appear in a market rather than the products of human labor. And I think that in many ways, one of the things that the power of the anti-sweatshop movements of the 1990s and the attempt to sort of trace the commodities that we use and think of as things to the places where they were actually made and the conditions under which they were made was a very powerful kind of political moment to make us think at least briefly, then we go back to our ordinary lives and we're using our iPhones and whatever and we don't think about where they are, but that that moment to break it. And it does seem to me this is a moment where to break those similar kinds of illusions about debt. 
and to stop thinking that somehow this is my moral thing. One of the interesting things that people who've studied debt have found is that most people don't believe that they're in debt. Most people only think they're in debt if they miss their payments. They're living in debt, but as long as they're making their payments, you don't think that you're in debt. You think you're in debt when you miss the payments, which is an interesting thing. And so that there are these kinds of ways that we just inhabit this world of debt. And it does seem to me this is a particular moment coming out of the financial crisis, coming out of the very visibility of the crisis of the banking sector and the financial sector, and challenged by people occupying spaces right next to these financial buildings that gives us a way to see the conditions of our daily life in a way that perhaps we had not really thought about that before. Uh, I, I think I can probably do better without it. Uh, I'd like to ask the question, can we affect a political change of the kind that you propose if we ourselves in the way we manage the political economy of this camp, do not recognize that production is a relation between people. Thank you. Did you want to say that? Is there something? No, that was clear, but I, but perhaps someone else who's at the camp would want to address that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. This, may, this may sound blasphemous at, at a uh, lecture that is clearly makes us all want to read more David Harvey, and more economics, and that such sort of thing. But is there a is there a, a, a fiction or a novel or a cultural moment? that speaks to this kind of break uh, that uh, in times when we're, we're not in an Occupy moment, uh, uh, a specific cultural moment that we might point to that helps us think through this debt thing, or maybe it's so new or recent that there really isn't anything of quality. Does that make sense as a question? It's mainly to Michael Denning, but... <laughs> yeah, no, I'm gonna give it to Eli because of the bit that you cut for a shorter version were all the songs, and in some ways... Yeah, I did try and think about how the question in a longer version of this piece has been mediated through various cultural forms, mostly thinking about music uh, in the kind of, in the mining town, the songs that people are listening to, the songs they were singing at the company store, you know, the great Merle Travis line, I owe my soul to the company store, but there were lots of others. And more recently in the 80s, I was, uh, thinking about the Bruce Springsteen album, Nebraska, which has a lot of references to debts that no honest man could pay. Um, in the kind of latest financial crisis in that moment, I, off the top of my head, I can't, I'm not sure there's anything I could cite, but there's certainly, I think, a lot of films that are speaking profoundly to this. Um, the film 2012, I think, some others. Uh, Another member of our group wrote her thing on uh, the Confessions of a Shopaholic series. She had a lot of interesting things to say about that, but maybe Drew could, can you think of anything? <laughs> there have been stories that we tell each other and tell ourselves about debt, uh, different kinds of debts and imagining them, but there's a, a long history of, of uh, stories about the debts owed to millers and the possessions of mills and sort of thinking about like a windmill and, and uh, those kinds of things. We, um, I can't remember, and debt as, uh, do you remember any of the others? There's one, there's one book, uh, Margaret Atwood, the uh, Canadian novelist wrote a book called Payback, which is kind of a cultural history of debt. She's reading the Bible, um, Charles Dickens, some other stuff, but that's quite interesting. I can't I can't remember the specifics. Early nineteen sixties. I have it at home, I can't remember it right now. Do you know what I'm talking about? Sure. Yeah, I, I think 
I guess what I found, one reason we do this is because we all come at it from a different angle and one learns from the other angles. I must say, I had not even thought of reading Confessions of a Shopaholic. And, uh, and, and because one of us was quite interested in this and found that even in something that is often dismissed as a kind of chick lit uh, a pulp novel to read in one's spare time is actually quite a profound and, and intriguing reflection on debt and on being in debt at the beginning and staying in debt and how to get out of that and in many ways the power of that book is not only the power of the romance of uh, which it certainly has but is the power of the fact that debt is there and that the kind of moral that the, the balance between on the one hand the moral imperative not to be in debt and on the other hand the moral and equal moral imperative to take part in a consumer society and to buy things and to and most of the things she's buying are actually not one of the interesting things in order just to waste stuff it's all imagined in order to make her get a better job to be better off to prepare herself in indeed for the labor market in a way and so in some sense in a case like that uh, there's a way in which I would as much encourage you to read Confessions of a Shopaholic as to read David Harvey. Uh. <laughs> Yay, that was the point of the question. <laughs> we have about five or six minutes left until we um, to give the space up. Yeah, we have to give the space up. This question has a little bit less to do with um, debt, but more to do with what you said about um, understanding where the commodities are coming from, in that sense, like understanding the labor force behind the commodity. So I'm kind of asking, what's your thoughts on the idea of boycotting certain products or certain companies that treat their workers badly? You would never shop. Just quickly, I think it's, it's a great idea, always a good idea, and I think kind of moving the Occupy model, you know, and making it mobile in a sense, going to Occupy a sort of, you know, target where they're trying to unionize or going to, you know, Occupy an at t building or something like that. So just a sort of a way of highlighting, you know, where surplus value is being produced, how it's happening, et cetera. I mean, I think, you know, the visibility of this movement can really play a big part in that. Yeah, the boycott has always been one of the social movement's greatest tools. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work like other tools, and so it's a key one. One of the things I've been struck by with the Occupy, and you can kind of help me with this one, it's the first movement I can think of that names itself by an imperative to do an action. There's a lots of movements, even over the last 30 or 40 years, that have named themselves over the people who are part of the movement, and who and that the movement is meant to emancipate or liberate and that there's a way in which a boycott Wall Street has that same kind of imperative that that imperative to occupy Wall Street to occupy Boston to occupy the other spaces is in many ways the kind of what is new about the movement one of the reasons that I think that it's actually spread so much is that that imperative to take action and take some space and perhaps not immediately worry about who we are as we're doing it, but to find that out as we're doing it. And that, I think, has been one of the great uh, challenges to all of us, of the people who have taken the step to occupy Boston and Wall Street and the rest of the world, even. Maybe, maybe we have time for one more question. All right, we have time for one more question. I've got one more question for you, and uh, this is uh, to return to uh, uh, a, a reference to, uh, well, to, if we think about the mentality of debt, I'm wondering if any of you would like to speak to uh, uh, what the ecological implications are of this mentality of debt. That is, you know, do we take upon ourselves individually uh, our, the ecological debt that we have incurred uh, without any a discrimination between uh, the kinds of ecological damage uh, that are uh, that are caused by um, the, the great the, the sort of the epic scale polluters uh, uh, within the industrial world. 
One of the other members of our group, Sigma Cologne, wrote a, a wonderful piece about environmental debt that I don't think I can do justice to, but maybe Michael or Eli can do. I'm, I'm not sure, and just quickly, since this was the last one, but I would say that I think what she found was both the interest in the number of movements around the world that found that the idea of an ecological debt first imagined as a response to the debt crisis, the third world debt crisis, the sense that, they, that people in the third world were in debt impoverished as they were, they were nonetheless in debt and had to pay the North Atlantic economies. And the turning of the round in that and saying, no, there is an ecological debt that is owed to our land and our places because of the extraction of resources over a century became a very powerful kind of way to imagine that. Now, it does raise all kinds of issues, and I think that's why the difficulty of trying to summarize, if Sigma were here, she almost was here today. Uh, her argument is that nonetheless, that was one of the places where the moral and the material definitions of debt come together. And the question of whether one can actually repay the debt to nature with currency is one that rem remains a, a very complicated political issue in lots of ways. What would be, re it's, it's partly the issue of reparations. How does one repay with money the debts to powerful historical wrongs one way or another. And that's one of the issues that certainly is at the heart of thinking about debt in a larger frame. Uh, and so that's just some brief kind of way of responding. Yeah, I, I got permission from uh, the people ahead of us or in front of us to ask one more question. And uh, this one will actually be directly relevant and it requires a bit of an analysis on your part. And that is how do you see uh, the liberation potential of something like microloans happening uh, across the world? Uh, because it's it's promised to be this great liberator around the world. I want you to talk a little bit wow, about that. Wow, great. It's great when you get the same question twice in the same day because you've already <laughs> practiced it. <laughs> but no, it does seem to me it was very interesting because microcredit has often been taken as the kind of answer to all of this. And just as a very brief thing, it's worth thinking of two different kinds of microcredit. One kind of microcredit is where all of these banks around there think, hmm, here's a different market. We could actually give smaller loans to people that, in order to, to street vendors, to home workers, uh, and in some ways make that a new kind of market. In general, that has not had very productive results. Then it actually turns into the same kinds of uh, debt peonage that Eli talked about in the first one. There's another form of micro credit. The Self-Employed Women's Association in India has tried this, where a union of informal workers have their own credit agency to lend to their own members. The money is put forward by their members and is lent to other members. And that's a way to try to have a kind of egalitarian uh, uh, recognizing that people have the need for credit, that debt is necessary part of thing, but that actually social movement organizations want one's unions, forms like that could be. And that's a very different vision of microcredit. So I would suggest thinking about the two different kinds of microcredit. Rather, usually when one reads in the Wall Street Journal or whatever, they mean the first one, which is it's a new market for people to get interest rates out of poor people. Let's offer a round of applause for our speakers. It was a great talk. We have, next week we have two more speakers. Bruno Bastille's on November 29th. He's the author of Badu and Politics and the Actuality of Communism, both books you should read. And on November 30th, Norman Finkelstein, a longtime activist in Palestinian solidarity, is coming at 5 o'clock. So please be there for that. To check out the video of these, this lecture and other lectures, which will hopefully be up in a few days, check out zinlectures.wordpress.com. Thank you.